Okay, in this second part, I want to discuss tractography parameter selection. Let me start with the stopping criterion, a very important parameter of tractography sometimes overlooked. With this parameter, you tell tractography where it can propagate following the diffusion orientation and where it must stop. A white matter mask obtained from a co-register high resolution T1 or from an atlas is advisable here, but sometimes you don't have access to those for your data or registration is an issue due to pathology. One thing that can be done is to derive a white matter mask from a diffusion map, such as the FA or the generalized FA. If this is the case, the best strategy is to use the threshold stopping criteria. This will interpolate the map at the current tracking position and threshold it dynamically. This will result in a smoother boundary than bannering the map beforehand and overall improve tractography. To do so, you need first to compute the diffusion map. In this case, the fractional anisotropy map derived from the diffusion tensor model. Then use it to create the threshold stopping criterion, which can later be used in the local tracking function as we did earlier. Another important thing to know is although we are using an accurate white matter mask for tractography, it is very likely that a large fraction of the reconstructed streamline will either end in the white matter or in the CSF. This varies from the quality of the diffusion data and the tractography algorithm, but on clinical data, you should expect somewhere between 15 to 50% of streamline having non-gray matter ending locations. One of the problems seems to be region with partial volume fraction of white matter, gray matter, and CSF. In those voxels, orientation information is harder to accurately estimate from the diffusion data making it more likely to find incoherent orientation. This will likely force the tractography to stop in the white matter in some cases. Moreover, small accumulated errors can lead tractography in correctly propagating outside the white matter mask. One solution is to incorporate this information in the tractography method. On LT brains, we know tractography should continue in the white matter shouldn't stop in the CSF and must reach the gray matter. We can thus better define those rules using the partial volume estimate of each tissue type. Moreover, partial volume estimate allow the tractography to determine if the generated streamline should or shouldn't be included in the final tractogram. Essentially, by knowing the tissue type, we can keep only the streamline that end in the gray matter. There are two methods implemented in DIPI that use inclusion and exclusion maps. The anatomically constrained tractography interpolate the partial volume estimate map and use threshold on the white matter value to stop or continue the tracking. The streamline is included if the fraction of gray matter is higher than the fraction of CSF. The continuous map criterion uses a similar approach but use probability derived from the tissue fraction to determine whether or not the streamline should stop and if, should, if it should be included or excluded from the final drug program. Then to reduce the number of excluded streamline, the particle filtering tractography approximate a distribution of short streamline segments given the partial volume estimates. To find an alternative trajectory when the tractography incorrectly stop in the white matter, or CSF. Whenever tractography stop incorrectly, for instance, here, the red streamline, it backtrack a few tractography step, for instance, a few millimeter, where the tractography was still propagating correctly in the white matter. It then initiate and run simultaneously the tractography for N sample trajectories. It weights them using the tissue map at each step, analyzing tractography trajectory going in voxel containing CSF. It stops after a few more tractography steps, and finally, finally it draws a sample from the weighted distribution and select that segment to replace the one that was ending in the CSF. It then restarts the tractography normally in the white matter. You can see the behavior of the PFT algorithm in this animation. The tractography return a few tracking steps, then multiple streamline segments are generated. Those going in the CSF get penalized. 
after a few steps, a segment is randomly sampled from the weighted distribution, and then the tractography continues normally. In the second example, we have two regions of gray matter, and the seed is placed over here. And you can see this narrow corridor of white matter here shown in black. The PFC algorithm deflects the streamline from the CSF voxel, keeping the trajectory in the white matter. It will be otherwise very difficult to find a trajectory in this narrow curved corridor of white matter. But using prior information on where the streamline should and should not stop, allow PFT to find a plausible pathway. To do this in that guy, we need to change the local tracking function with the particle filtering tracking function. It takes as input the direction getter, here for instance, the probabilistic direction getter, a CMC or ACT stopping criteria that contain the partial volume estimate information and the seeds. We can then generate the streamline as we did previously. In a very similar fashion, we can perform the particle filtering cartography algorithm in the terminal using the DIPI workflows. The main difference here is that we input the three partial volume estimate instead of the tracking mask. Again, we can visualize the resulting cartography. The tube are the centroid of bundles of streamline. The larger they are, the more streamline are in the bundle. You can fil filter the center rate visible by length or by size. You can also expand clusters to see all the generated streamline. In red, a part of the corpus callosum. In green, the inferior frontal occipital fasciculus. And finally here in blue, the, cor the cortical spinal tract. Another thing to consider is where you want to initiate tractography and how many seeds you want. The seed from mask function will place seeds in all voxel of the mask. With density one, the seed will be placed at the center of the voxel with density two, the seed will be placed on a two by two by two grid, generating eight seeds per voxel. With density three, seeds will be placed on a three by three by three grid, forming 27 seeds per voxel. With the random seed from mask, seeds are placed randomly within the voxel boundary. You can either generate n seed per voxel or n seeds total for the whole seed mask. For whole brain connectivity analysis, it is recommended to use one to 10 million streamline or even more. For large bundle estimation, such as the CST or corpus callosum, fewer seed might be enough. For narrow white matter structure, such as the fornix or the ucinate fasciculus, targeted region of interest seeding might be more effective to estimate the bundle trajectory. When creating your streamline generator, there's a parameter called max cross. When set to one, the initial orientation will be the orientation of maximum diffusivity or the peak with the highest fiber ODF value. If this value is higher, it will start up to that many streamline, one for each of the peaks at the seed location. Thus one seed location can generate multiple streamlines. Another parameter is return all. By default, it is set to true and thus will return all generated streamline, including those ending in the white matter or CSF. Depending on your case study, you may or may not be interested in those streamlines. When extracting the peaks from ODF using the peaks from model function, two parameters are of RF interest and might need to be adjusted to your reconstruction model and the noise level of your data. The first is the relative peak threshold orientation with ODF value inferior to this value will be, will be considered spurious peaks and not be extracted. The second is the minimum separation angle. Most reconstruction methods cannot distinguish peak below 30 degrees or so. But in some cases, you might be interested in relaxing this peak extraction constraint and allow peaks with smaller angle between them. 
Ideally, here you want those parameters to allow the extraction of the accurate, accurately estimated peaks while reducing the amount of spurious peaks. If you want to get started with tractography and DiPi, you will find the most relevant function in the tracking and direction modules. Please go on the DiPi website and browse the tutorial. You will find the code I use for the presentation with additional details, references, and visualization function. You will also find additional tracking algorithm variants and local reconstruction method. I hope you enjoyed the talks. Feel free to reach out for questions and help with your data.